Hi, this is Professor Mulcahy again. <clears throat> and today's topic is birth procedures and medical management of labor. Um, these are interventions that we would do to facilitate and promote either um, better labor or sometimes just deliver the baby if labor isn't going well or if there are reasons not to do uh, not to labor a patient. Um, and we'll discuss the nurse's responsibility because a lot of these will be collaborative interventions. You're not doing them per se, but you are assisting. Um, we're going to chunk it into four parts. Part one is before labor begins, and then we'll go on to part two, which is um, during active labor. That's mostly your pharmacologic pain management. Part three will be um, interventions during second stage, and we'll talk about episiotomies, forceps deliveries, uh, vac vacuum deliveries. We'll touch on C-sections. And then the last part would be um, very short, part four, which is active management of third stage labor. But let's start. Um, so our first topic is external version. Let me show you the video first so you can see what that looks like. How are you? How are you? Good. Okay. Is it okay? And you note that the provider, there's jelly all over, and that's because she had an ultrasound. It'll also help the provider's hands sort of move slowly or, or smoothly around the belly. And you can see he's locating the head and he's turning kind of pushing that baby's head down. This one doesn't take very long. Sometimes they take a little bit longer. <laughs> but you see, he just turned the baby, and he's pretty confident. Then they get the ultrasound. Yeah, baby's vertex now. Doesn't mean the baby will stay that way. <clears throat> That's why he's saying, stay down, please. Yep. So that's sort of went well. Sometimes they don't. Um, but the reason for the procedure is really to change a baby who's not in a good position for birth, their breech, their transverse, and we're going to change them to uh, vertex head down presentation <clears throat> so that they can be born vaginally. Now in the old days, people used to deliver breech babies vaginally, especially frank breech. Um, but the risk there is head entrapment because the breech is not the biggest part of the baby. The head is, so sometimes um, the cervix will dilate and the pelvis will allow the breech to come down and then the head gets stuck. And now we have an emergency situation and we have to push the whole baby back up to get the baby out abdominally. It doesn't usually end well. Um, so external version gives us an alternative to just saying, let's call it a section. Um, it works best when your mom has a normal BMI and her abdominal wall is real accessible. You can get right to that uterine muscle and baby without a lot of layers of tissue in the way. It works best when your baby's a normal size or even on the smaller size um, because they'll move better. Real big babies start to run out of room and then they get wedged. Um, and you need adequate amniotic fluid. So before this procedure is done, they're gonna do an ultrasound to make sure that that cord has plenty of room. Because as you see, the biggest risk of uh, this procedure is either a cord accident or an abruption. Let me get my pointer out. So cord accident, um, it's kind of a euphemism, I guess. If the cord is around the baby's neck, if there's a true knot in the cord, some of you might see that in clinical and think your kid's so lucky to be born okay. Um, or if the cord just gets squished and reduces the blood flow to that baby, we might see some bradycardia and that becomes an emergency. Um, also, he didn't have to really push hard on her belly as you saw in that video, but sometimes there's a lot more aggressive manipulation that goes on. Um, it just depends on how stubborn that kid is and how uh, relaxed mom's abdominal wall is. So there is that risk. And because of that, you sh this is not a do it yourself at home kind of project. You need to do it where there's access to an OR. Where I work, we do it in the OR. That way, if it turns into a C-section and the last one I was in did, um, we can move very quickly. <clears throat> The other risk is that some babies just seem to like being upside down or right side up, whichever way you want to call it, and they go right back to being breech or transverse. They're happier there, um, and that's what's called an unstable eye. So when a mom has had a version, say, at 36 weeks, and the baby was confirmed to be head down, before she comes in to be induced for labor, they really should check with an ultrasound. Okay, so indications, like we said, breach or transverse lie, they have to be at least 36 weeks to qualify for this procedure. 
And you can go ahead and do it if the baby's heart rate is reactive, the non-stress test is reactive. We need those two ax cells, at least 15 beats per minute for 15 seconds each in a 20 minute period. That's just review. That's what an NST is. Um, we need ad adequate amniotic fluid. Um, it's a lot easier if the presenting part is not engaged, it should really be floating. Um, so that, you know, if you have those buttocks or, you know, a footling breed or whatever wedged in the pelvis, it's going to be very hard to convince that baby that turning over is a good idea. Um, the size should be appropriate for gestational age. It shouldn't be a baby who's maybe compromised with intrauterine growth restriction. It should not be a baby who's really macrosomic. Um, we have some contraindications and they're here. These would be reasons not to do it. If you have a history of placental abruption, kind of makes sense not to do something that puts you at a great risk for placental abruption. Severe preeclampsia, sometimes the stress of this procedure is enough to trigger, um, you know, eclamptic seizures in mom, which then increase your risk of placental abruption. Or um, sometimes what we see in preeclampsia, just like your reflexes get brisker, um, uterine muscle sometimes is more contract contractile. Um, and we can put mom in sort of a irritable state uterine wise, but mostly, you know, we want to avoid somebody who's so sick that they can't tolerate this procedure. Any non reassuring fetal status, like variable decelerations, especially if your cords already being compressed, you don't want to do anything that's going to risk a cord accident. If your baby's having lates or minimal variability, obviously, this isn't a baby who's going to tolerate this vigorous procedure, you are kind of better off just calling it a day. Um, oligohydramnios, oligo of anything means there's not enough. It's too little, just like oliguria is too little urine. Oligohydramnios is too little amniotic fluid. Hyd that H-Y-D-R means water and amnio, you know, means the amniotic sac. So there's not enough water in the amniotic sac. That would be a contraindication because of suspected cord accident. If we think this baby is going to weigh more than nine pounds, not a good idea to try and turn them. It's, you know, they don't have enough room. We can cause fetal injury and it's probably not a great indication for a vaginal delivery anyway. Um, nuchal cord. If we can visualize a nuchal cord on ultrasound, this would be like a relative contraindication. Um, most providers would not risk it. Um, placenta previa, for obvious reasons, why are you going to put the baby in position for a vaginal delivery when C-section is the only safe mode? And obviously you can sort of rupture the placenta that way. And moms who have had previous uterine surgery, if there are previous section, if there are previous hysterotomy, um, you don't really necessarily want to manipulate that uterus because you risk uterine rupture. So those would be reasons to do it and reasons not to do it. Um, care. So some places, and mine is one of them, will give some terbutaline to make sure that the uterus is relaxed. Remember, terbutaline was a tocolytic. It stops contractions. And that will relax the uterus um, and make it easier to get this baby. If the uterus starts contracting, it makes it much tougher to get that baby to move. Um, you may use ultrasound. That's almost always indicated to locate the position of the fetus. You want to see where that head is. You know where to apply your pressure. Um, and you want to visualize the placenta. Um, a lot of places, mine included, will give mom an epidural before the version starts. Number one, it's not the most comfortable procedure. So that's a, an important aspect of pain relief. Um, it'll also keep mom from jumping around so that the provider can get this done. And um, if the, in the event that there is an adverse effect, you have that cord accident or that placental abruption, you can proceed with a C-section, um, given that the epidural is adequate for that. And then we want to make sure that the use of fetal monitoring is happening so that we can see any non-reassuring changes in the heart rate. Now, during the version, you can't really put those leads on because the provider needs that space to work, um, but before and after, definitely. Okay, so that is external version. We're going to move on to methods to initiate and promote labor. So these are your cervical ripening and induction agents. We use these all the time. It used to be a joke. We don't have babies without Pitocin. It's not entirely true. But I've got some pictures. Amnihook, Cervidil, Pitocin, Cook's Balloon. We're going to get familiar with all of them. Okay, so... For any of these procedures, whether it's cervical ripening or induction, 
there are some reasons to do it and some reasons not to do it. Um, indications or reasons to do it mean that we have a mom and a baby that are ready for delivery and there's a condition there that says it really should begin sooner than later. We don't want to wait for spontaneous labor to occur in certain um, conditions. So we have some maternal conditions. Moms who have hypertension, um, whether it's chronic or preeclampsia, we want to time that delivery before mom gets really, really sick. <clears throat> And then we have a, a sequence of events that puts both mom and baby at risk. So if she has preeclampsia, the recommendation now is no later than 37 weeks. There is no, nothing to be gained and everything to be lost. If she has chronic hypertension, um, the current recommendation, to my knowledge, is 38 weeks. With If she doesn't have any superimposed preeclampsia, um, with fetal surveillance all the way through. Um, gestational diabetes, a lot of times... Whether it's pre-gestational or gestational, providers really don't want moms to go past 39, you know, all the way to 40 weeks. They can go to like 39 and change um, because the placenta starts to get old. The baby starts to get huge. It's sort of a now or never kind of thing. Again, nothing to be lost from delivery and everything to be gained. So um, gestational diabetes would be another one. Especially if the baby's starting to get large and you think that maybe if we get the baby out now, it'll fit. But you wait a week and it might not. Um, Preeclampsia. Um, again, we kind of just discussed that under hypertension. Cholestasis is, um, cholestasis of pregnancy is actually fairly common. It's gallstones and some people will get the pups rash with that. Um, and the reason that we want to induce at 38 weeks or no later than 38 weeks for those folks is that for some reason that I don't understand particularly well, it is associated with like a triple risk of um, like threefold risk of stillbirth. Still not common, um, but three times more than the average mom will have. And so they don't play around with that. They'll treat with Actigol, um during pregnancy if they notice um, that there's cholestasis of pregnancy and then they'll deliver at 38 weeks. Uh, preterm or pre prolonged rupture membranes. Mom's water broke and she didn't go into labor on her own. Well, you know, the clock is ticking for infection. So we want to get her delivered. Um, and then we have some fetal factors, intrauterine growth retardation, or a small baby who's not getting perfused might be better off out than in, um, out where he can get breast milk and formula and not in oxygen and not inside where he's maybe got some compromised conditions. Oligohydramnios, again, if there's not a lot of fluid, we don't want to risk that um, baby's cord's going to get compressed and cause some issues. So we'll want to get those patients delivered if they're at term. Um, and non-reassuring fetal status. So that's kind of a catch-22 because some babies with non-reassuring fetal status will not tolerate labor, but you give it a try. Um, so if they come in and their biophysical profile, their BPP is six out of 10 or four out of 10, um, you'll try that induction first. Try to affect a vaginal delivery before the conditions in utero get any worse. Um, if they have variable D cells, something like that, where you're just like, you know, I'd rather not sit on this patient. I'd really like to get this baby out where we can help it. Um, that would be another indication. And then IUFD or intrauterine fetal demise um, would be a condition where you might not want to keep mom pregnant until spontaneous labor begins because of the risk of infection. Um, you would want to get her delivered. So you would use cervical ripening. That is not a topic that we're going to cover today that occurs all the way at the end of this course or this section of the course under unexpected outcomes, but it would be a reason that you could do induction. So some reasons not to do it. What are the contraindications to inducing labor? Well, any reason not to have a vaginal delivery is a reason not to have induction. Um, client refusal. If your client has been educated about the risks versus benefits and decides she is no way, shape or form going to have um, an induction of labor because she's scared of Pitocin or she wants to go completely natural with as little intervention as possible. We can't just do it. Um, most, a lot of women get to 39 weeks and they get what's called TOP or tired of pregnancy. And they are more than happy to sign up for anything we have to offer that makes it go faster. Um, however, if the client says, no, I can't do it, then you're not gonna start an induction against her consent. Um, placenta previa. Obviously, we've talked about placenta previa. You know why we don't want to do an induction, because you can't deliver that patient vaginally. 
active HSV or herpes simplex virus. Talked about that as well. If there are active lesions, we risk transmission to the baby during delivery. Um, so we don't want to induce that patient. Same thing with malpresentations. If they're breech, if they're transverse, if they're shoulder, if they're chin, whatever, you know, variation you have on not normal, um, we're not going to induce that labor. Um, prolapsed cord. If you have a prolapsed cord, you're having a C-section right now this very minute. Um, so you wouldn't start an induction then. Um, previous C-section with vertical uterine incision. So that's sort of something we'll cover under C-sections, but if you get an operative report that somebody had an emergency C-section or they had a C-section in another country, and instead of that low bikini line cut in the lower segment of the uterus, um, we have like a classical incision or um, it kind of goes down the abdomen, like maybe from the belly button to the pubis. And again, we'll talk a little bit more under C-section. There's a skin incision, incision and a uterine incision. Um, you can't always tell what the uterine one was by looking at the skin. But if they've had that, they're at risk for uterine rupture with contraction. So if they have any history of uterine rupture, any risk factors for uterine rupture, we're not going to do any of these things. Um, first, we'll talk about cervical ripening agents. That's a cervidil, looks like a shoelace. The medicine is in this part here. Okay, that little tab. Um, that is loaded with denoprostone. It is a prostaglandin, and prostaglandins are associated with initiation of labor and cervical ripening. Cervidil is the most common I've seen. Prepidil gel used to be the thing to do, but it's a lot less predictable than cervidil. It's the same agent. But you see how cervidil has that string and you can kind of pull it. Um, with prepidil, you, there's no way to get rid of that gel if you hyperstimulate the uterus or if the baby doesn't tolerate it. Um, so cervidil has sort of replaced prepidil. Once you put the cervidil in, or you don't put the cervidil in, let me clarify, a licensed independent provider will put the cervidil in, you will assist. Um, it stays in for 12 hours. Mom has to lay in bed for two hours, so you always caution her to empty her bladder first, um, just so it doesn't fall out. Um, it goes way back into the posterior cervix, you kind of, uh, posterior fornix, so the vagina, you kind of tuck it behind the cervix, or it gets tucked behind the cervix. You are not doing anything as a nurse, um, except assisting and documenting. Um, Cervidil is actually really common. It doesn't usually initiate labor. So if you bring people in for induction, sometimes you bring them in the evening, you give them a cervidil and an Ambien, you send them night, night. Um, and then, you know, 12 hours later, you take it out and hopefully their cervix is softer, it's thinner, and it has moved anteriorly. That's the job of cervidil. Sometimes if, you know, if mom is sort of ready to go, that cervidil may uh, kind of kick her into a spontaneous labor. Um, but the expected response is cervical ripening, that softness, thinness, and um, anterior movement of the cervix. Now, meso or mesoprostol or cytotec, they're all the same thing. Now, I want you to notice here's a little thing. That's how it looks when it's sitting on the pharmacy shelf. This dose is 100 micrograms. I don't think it comes smaller than 50, and we usually give it to start 25. The manufacturer refuses to make it. Um, in the doses that we use for vaginal delivery because they don't want anything to do with any lawsuits that come from the use of this product. However, it is widespread um, in its use as a cervical ripening agent. <clears throat> it is considered an off-label use. It can be given orally, buccally, which means in the cheek, um, kind of between the cheek and the gum, or it can be given vaginally. Um, for postpartum bleeding, it can be given rectally, but that's a whole separate topic. Um, let me go back because I wanted to say one more thing about cervical ripening agents. Now, these cervical ripening agents work with prostaglandins. One of the big problems, because they work to soften the cervix, we absolutely do not want to use them with anyone who has had a previous C-section because they soften the lower uterine segment to the point where maybe that scar tissue will loosen up and we'll have a uterine rupture, which is a life-threatening emergency for both patients. Um, so just be aware of that. And a lot of times the decision of whether it's cervidil pit or a rupture, it kind of depends on the results of the cervical exam. So they're supposed to do what's called a Bishop score first. Do not worry about that. It's not gonna be content that I test, um, but they check the cervix and see how favorable it is. And if it's remote, 
from actual change or labor, we're going to start with one of these guys and move on to the more interesting things. So amniotomy. Amniotomy is the artificial rupture of membranes. You may see it abbreviated as AROM, A-R-O-M, in the chart. Um, and that is when they take a hook, like this one. And with a vaginal exam, they kind of snag the bag and they rupture the membranes. So there are two things that that does. It allows the presenting part to be better applied to the cervix. And you hope at this point that the presenting part is a head. It kind of better be. Um, and it stimulates pro the release of prostaglandin, um, again, which will get labor started. Now, in order for this to be successful, the cervix has to be dilated at least one to two centimeters, or else they're not going to be able to get to the bag through the cervix. It's not something you can force through a closed cervix. Um, so the patient has to have a little bit of a head start. Um, they also have to have some fetal descent. And I'll discuss that in a second. Um, so the risks, once you do an amniotomy, there are a couple of risks to it. The biggest one is infection. Once the membranes are ruptured, we're on a clock because the longer that patient stays ruptured, and especially if we're doing a lot of vaginal exams, the higher her risk of an infection called chorioamnionitis. Um, and that's infection of the chorion and the amnion, which are the fetal, the membranes and the lining of the uterus. So, um, we want to monitor for infection, do a temperature every two hours. And, you know, we're going to practice very careful hygiene, minimize vaginal exams to prevent that risk. Cord prolapse is another risk. This is probably one of the most um, life-threatening, or we had one last night um, when I was at work. It can be life-threatening to a fetus. So what happens is the baby's floating, 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 and the provider gets impatient and they rupture membranes, let's say, or maybe mom's me membranes just rupture spontaneously. And because the baby's still kind of floating and the cord is kind of floating with it, the cord will come down first. Um, so, you know, this is one of those things where maybe you have to advocate for your patient. And if you sense that the station is really high, or the provider tells you that the station is high um, and they ask for an amni hook, you just say, I'm uncomfortable with that. Um, and then maybe uh, talk to them a little bit privately, not where the patient can hear you. Um, and then lastly, if the mom has a placenta previa and didn't know it, um, they could poke a hole through it. Um, so those are some considerations with amniotomy, but it does seem to work too. Sometimes you just use it to augment a labor that's already occurring and not going very quickly, um, but it can also be used as a method of induction. And then we have mechanical dilatation. I know some of you in clinical have seen or have heard about Foley bulbs. Um, you can also use this device. See how similar it is to the balloon in Foley. Um, it, what it does is it puts manual, it, it puts mechanical pressure on the cervix and kind of opens it. it goes between the membranes and the cervix too. So it sort of acts to strip the membranes and that stimulates the release of prostaglandin, which again will help ripen your cervix and maybe start labor. Um, cervix needs to be at least, again, one to two centimeters dilated to push that catheter in. And it's, you know, unlike the amni hook, which is kind of rigid, the Foley bulb or the Cook's catheter is kind of soft and it wants to flop around. Um, so the provider has to be a little bit skilled at doing that. Um, the nurse's responsibilities. We assist with this procedure. Like, I, you know, usually you'll get bowls of sterile water and big syringes and you blow up those balloons. Um, the Cook's catheter is nice because it puts pressure on both sides, but a Foley could be used and it's actually a little bit cheaper. Um, you're going to educate the patient on what this procedure is and what it does. You are particularly going to educate your patient on the fact that dilatation doesn't always mean true labor. The cervix, by the time this Foley bulb comes out, whether it comes out on its own or whether it's removed, could be four centimeters, five centimeters, six centimeters. It does not mean that active labor is occurring. It just means that we stretched it um, to that point. Remember that true labor is cervical change caused by effective, painful uterine contractions. <laughs> Um, so if mom's not contracting and you pull this Foley balloon out, she'll be five for the rest of her life, um, unless you do something about her, and unless she kicks into labor on her own. Um, but you're going to educate the patient about that. This will help things get started, but you won't be in true labor until you have regular, 
moderate to strong contractions that are changing the cervix on their own. Um, you're going to document the time that it goes in. You're going to document the time that it comes out, whether it comes out because you, the provider deflated all the balloons or whether it falls out because mom became dilated to the, you know, the size, the diameter of the balloon. Oops, let's go back to slide 11. Sorry about that. And we're going to go to oxytocin. Oxytocin is like ubiquitous on the labor and delivery unit. It's kind of the one drug that we know backwards and forwards um, because we use it all the time on almost every single patient. Um, if we don't use it during labor as an induction or augmentation agent, we are using it most likely postpartum to control bleeding. So what oxytocin does, it is a hormone that is secreted by the anterior pituitary um, endogenously, but we give it as an exogenous hormone. It's synthesized in a lab and they put it, this label here is kind of what I'm used to, um, the concentration, 30 units in 500 ml. When you work out the math, if you beg me, I'll do it for you. It ends up being one milli unit equals one ml. So if you want, or one milli unit per minute equals one ml per hour. It's a fancy math problem, but every labor nurse kind of knows the concentration in the bag they always use and they do the math very quickly. So if I want to start my pit at one milli unit per minute and I have this bag, I just start my drip at one ml per hour. Um, and you do start slowly. Um, pit works best. Pitocin is the other word for oxytocin. If your cervix is favorable, because what pit does is it stimulates contractions. Well, if your cervix is hard as a rock, it's like that rubber band on the broccoli that doesn't want to stretch no matter what you do to it and requires a lot of force. You can give mom contractions all day and they will hurt, um, but they might not change the cervix the way you intended. Um, so it's most effective if cervix is already ripe. So if somebody comes in for induction, the first thing they do is a vaginal exam to determine which agent is appropriate. When you do start pit, you start it slow. Most places will have orders like start at two MUs per minute, increase by two every half an hour, or start at one MU per minute, increase by two every, you know, 45 minutes. They'll, there will be a policy that sort of spells out in a physician's order that tells you how often you can go up. Now, the part of it that requires nursing judgment is this titration part. If you have never heard the term titrate, let me explain it to you. It means the dose depends on the patient's response. So there's no one dose. There's never start oxytocin at three MUs per minute and leave it there indefinitely. It's not that kind of a medication. So the nurse needs to be able to interpret labor progress, uh, maternal response, fetal response, and then decide, do I want to increase the dose? Do I want to keep the dose the same? Or do I want to maybe turn this off or reduce the dose? There's a lot of nursing judgment. The provider is not going to sit there and tell you to up the pit every half an hour. He's going to expect you to know um, when that's appropriate. And usually what you want with Pitocin is contractions of a moderate to strong intensity that occur every two to three minutes, lasting about 60 seconds. Um, that's what's going to give you a baby. Those kind of contractions with a ripe cervix or, you know, hopefully enough to cause that cervical dilatation um, that eventually progresses to birth. There are some risks with Pitocin. It is considered a fairly high risk medication and because we're titrating it and we're using our judgment, we need to be aware of these risks. The first one, the most common thing that you might read about or see is tachycystole. Tachycystole we covered in the fetal monitoring video. It means too many contractions. Systole is the work, right? Like when you have a systolic blood pressure, that's the heart at work. This is the uterus at work. Tachy means fast. It's working too fast. So we have contractions that are less than every two to three minutes. Maybe they're every one to two minutes, or maybe they last 90 seconds to 120 seconds. Um, but we're having hyperstimulation of the uterus. It's important to palpate the uterus between contractions to make sure that it really rests um, in between. Um, because if we keep going, we're going to have these two conditions. If we keep going with tachycystole, the first person who's going to probably, unless we have a previous section or something like that, first person who's going to complain is the baby. And you're going to see signs of hypoxia on the monitor. That's when you start to see your minimal variability, your late decelerations. Um, if baby is not tolerating labor, 
Remember, every time the uterus squeezes, it's also contracting on the blood vessels in the placenta. So it, babies are built for a certain amount of stress. They've been training for this marathon for nine months. Um, but, you know, we can injure the runner here if we stress it out too much. Um, and then we're going to look for signs of uterine rupture, which is something that it's too lengthy a topic to cover under this. Just know that it is a risk. Um, and women who are most at risk would be your, um, what we call TOLAX or trial of labor after cesareans. Um, PIT is a good agent for induction for somebody with a cesarean. You just have to be much more careful and you have to be more hands-on with this patient, literally. Hands on the belly. How strong are those contractions? How long do they last? Make sure your toe goes in the right spot and make sure that your hands verify what your toco is reading and make sure that the uterus relaxes in between. So we need to have continuous fetal monitoring. This is not the mom who can have a Doppler check every half an hour for one contraction and 30 seconds after or 60 seconds after. Um, this mom needs to be on continuous monitoring because you are titrating the dose of this medication according to response. And if you don't know what that response is, you have no business running pit. Now, unfortunately, when mom's up and walking or in the jacuzzi tub or on the birthing ball or in the rocking chair or just writhing around the bed, sometimes it can be difficult to keep the baby's heart rate on, um, but we have to try. And that might be an instance where you have to call your provider and advocate maybe for internal monitoring so that you can see the baby a little bit better. Um, most places are now instituting the use of a safety checklist. So, you know, it's like um, a menu in a Chinese restaurant. If you have this from column A, and column A is about your contractions, they are, you know, the, that they are less, no, no more frequent than every two to three minutes. They don't last, you don't have two that last longer than 120 seconds. Um, it talks about uterine activity. And then column B um, is all the things that the baby must have in order for you to keep using this medication. So they need to have at least moderate variability. They need you know, they can have some decelerations, but there's limits on it. Just know that um, there's decision-making tools that help you decide whether or not it's safe to increase uh, or maintain this medication. And then if the complications do arise, if you have to turn off that pit because your baby had like a four minute decel or your mom went into tachycystole or something like that, um, know to give good SBAR to your provider and that provider should come down, evaluate the patient, and make a new plan. Okay, so that is the end of this video.